Um, and just bear with this for one second while I do something. Okay, there we go. And we while are now I officially live. Okay, hi everyone. I am joined by Abdullah Gondal uh, for this very special live stream. Um, unannounced, unplanned, <laughs> but let's do this. Um, Abdullah Gondal has gone through and uh, created uh, a set of slides that he's going to share with us on the topic of uh, is Islam a personality cult? But before we get into that, how are you doing, man? It's been a long time. Oh, I'm doing amazing. Just busy with life, starting school soon. Um, so wait, I've been trying wait, to get wait. My... You're telling me you have a life? You don't just do this all day? <laughs> of course I don't do this all day. I mean, I barely do it now. It's just like sitting on the bus. I'll write a post. So wait, I've been trying wait, to get in. Like, most of my reading is done on my commute back from work or going to work or to school. Um, so today, I mean, um, the topic I chose is 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 convenient revelations and how Muhammad used the Quran. Like, it will be so, so, so obvious. I mean... And as a Muslim, like now when I was making the presentation, I was I was just bewildered. Like, why did I not notice any of this this before? This so, so, so obvious manipulation of people using religious blackmail, right? And it also follows from the Quran telling us, you know, Quran. Mm -hmm. like don't you like think about it, don't you see it? Uh, so what I also want to show today is that not only Muhammad using the Quran to his benefit. But also, like how crazy and fanatic his followers were, like how they they admired him to like extremist levels. And we're also gonna go through a couple of other things. Like we'll also see how Muhammad indirectly would uh, put verses out that will be like just, like, just self appreciation like i'm the best of the best blah 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 and when you look at it from that light from the psychological perspective of muhammad the prophet and there's certain parts like uh, where you substitute the word allah for muhammad and that's when the real meaning of the verse will come out and it also gives you a very uh, deep glance into the frustrations of muhammad like how whenever he was challenged he would uh, resort to using uh, threats and instead of actually giving an answer, he'll just threaten them in or say, oh, if you don't agree with me, you're going to go to hell, so you better. Um, so uh, without further further ado, let's let's get into it. I mean, it's about 33 slides. So okay. Sounds yeah. good. All right. So <clears throat> convenient revelations. Is Islam a personality cult? So as Abdullah Gondal said, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, a bunch of things that Abdullah, um, that Abdullah Gondal has collected. And um, just to keep in mind that we're not saying that this is necessarily what Muslims do. Like, obviously, a lot of the things in here Muslims can't do because Muhammad isn't around. So, like, collecting his spittle and stuff like that. Like, some of the strange, strange things. But but what we want you to... So, so Abdullah Gondal, if you don't know who he is, he's an ex-Muslim from Pakistan. Uh, he's left Islam, what, two, three years ago now? Yeah, about 2017 May, so yeah, two okay. years almost, yeah. And uh, I'm also an ex-Muslim from Canada, and uh, so both of us left Islam independently of our own, and we became good friends. Uh, what we're doing here is we want people to, especially Muslims, to just think about, like, like just, just think, is there any red flags here? Is there something here that can make you reconsider whether this is truly from God? We're not here just to poke fun. We don't do this because we have nothing better to do. Like Abdullah Gondal has a life, I have a life. We're doing this as a social effort, as a, as a, as a sort of sadaqa, as you can say. A sadaqa. We're hoping to have this sadaqa jariya even, you could say, an ongoing charity by creating these set of videos to help people to consider whether this is truly from God. And if it's not, then you have everything to lose because you're one and only life you're spending on a false religion, right? So this is why we do it. We, we saw the light, so to speak, and we want to help other people see the light. So um, do you have the slides open as well? Yeah, I do. Okay, so, uh, okay, so slide two. Go ahead. Perfect. So uh, like you can see, we have divided it up into four uh, different parts. Uh, the first part is going to focus on verses in the Quran that ask you to obey Muhammad and almost literally put Muhammad on the same pedestal as Allah himself. Uh, 
And then we'll jump into the second uh, part, which is uh, pretty dark if you look at it from a psychological perspective, where this uh, delusional man is going on and on about praising himself as the best man and the best example, the most righteous. Uh, and following from there is the most interesting bit, uh, part three. That's where we're going to discuss uh, direct manipulation, where Muhammad wanted something and would literally just use Allah as his puppet to gain exactly what he wanted. And then uh, we will, in part four, go and look at the kind of people who followed him and the level of fanaticism they had. I actually did have a fifth part to it, which was blasphemy, but then I realized that that would stretch out the conversation too long and blasphemy itself is a, a whole uh, separate topic. Uh, so we'll leave that aside, but that also ties in nicely with it. Okay. So um, let's get into uh, slide uh, number four. Okay. This is the first slide for the first chapter. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you notice here, to have Allah's love and his pleasure, you have to literally attain Muhammad's love, Muhammad's pleasure, and obey Muhammad. Now, it's you can clearly see what he's trying to do here. It's like, hey, you love Allah, you love God. Okay, you know what God wants you to do? God wants you to follow and love me. Can I prove that God's actually talking to me? No. But as soon as you you cement this belief into someone's head, you've put them in a vicious circle where you have complete control over their, their mind and their decisions because you can blackmail them using religious beliefs like exactly here. And it gets worse. Like if, uh, uh, let's keep going. Um, so for example, in this one, you can see that to get God's mercy, one needs to obey Muhammad no matter what the cost. And like, uh, why would God make his mercy contingent upon the uh, obedience to a fallible 7th century man. I mean, is that exactly this kind of tactic is what you see over and over uh, in cults where religious people, people in position of power and authority, abuse uh, their positions. Mm -hmm. So I would just add that, again, you know, we can't prove, uh, we're not trying to necessarily prove right now that this is not Allah, some imaginary, sorry, I shouldn't say imaginary, some, some deity outside of Muhammad speaking. We're saying, like, think about it. Is it possible that this is Muhammad talking, not another entity? And does this raise any red flags? Yes, it raises some huge red flags. If somebody is telling you, you need to love me, and if you love me, then God's going to love you. Now, that's, that's something to think about. Is this truly from God? So that, just, to, just to jump in there. All right. Exactly. I agree with you. And like, this is the problem. Like, if once you get into this belief and this mindset, then it becomes like a cycle. The person has complete control over you. You might be thinking it's God speaking, but it's actually just a guy appointing himself as an imaginary deity's mouthpiece yeah. and manipulating you. And in the early Dawa, I, w I mean, we were taught, sorry, we were taught in the early Dawa, the emphasis is on you know, Tawheed and emphasis on Jahannam and Jannah to emphasize heaven and hell, to emphasize the belief in the hereafter so that once they're hooked, then you can sell them anything. Exactly, exactly. And like when you go to the next slide or when, as we progress, so we'll see. Uh, yes. Okay. You'll notice that from just asking people to obey him, to gain God's love, they are now changing into threats where you're literally used telling people, hey, obey me. If you don't, then God will burn you. And this is like one of th those, uh, these are really strong anchors in a believer's brain because he actually believes that the reality of the afterlife is more real than this life. And then you use that belief as a blackmail to tell him that, to scare him into obedience. It's, it's it's really really it like once you go forward, if we keep going to uh, the next slide, we four fifty nine. You'll notice like he keeps putting his obedience 
next to Allah. You notice this phrase, wa Allah, wa Rasul, wa Allah, wa Rasul, like obey Allah and his messenger. And there are certain verses where he even excludes Allah completely. He's like, obey Allah. Like, obey the messenger, <laughs> obey Muhammad. Mean? Yeah, obey the messenger. And he excludes Allah at certain points. That's interesting. So, uh, are we are on slide six right now? 459. 459, okay. All right. And like exactly as you can see in like a verse 480, it says, he who obeys Allah has, who who obeys Muhammad Sorry, has obeyed Allah. Oh yeah, at the bottom. Okay, yeah. Yeah. It's like, he who obeys the messenger has obeyed God. You're literally elevating the Muhammad's actions in a, terms of authority to the equivalent of God. But then, then, like straight up a threat after. But those who turn away, they're done. Mm -hmm. Now, in the next slide, you will notice where uh, <clears throat> Muslims are not allowed to disagree with Muhammad on anything whatsoever. Here we have three different verses where you're told that if Muhammad judges between you, you just have to agree. There is no second option. And in verse 33, 36, like anybody who disagrees, it's a clear cut uh, statement that he has gone into error. Nobody, and in the, th the last one, uh, 2451, it's, uh, it's amazing. It then puts it as an attribute of the believers that they're so submissive. Only thing the good believer has to say to Muhammad, we hear and we obey. <laughs> so what's happening right now is not only Muhammad is saying that my obedience will get you closer to God and get you his love. <coughs> and also the most beloved of the people, the most pious ones are the ones that are the that are the most submissive. They'll just surrender their intellect completely to Muhammad at his disposal, do whatever, we hear and we obey. So he makes the the, the attributes of the pious, It's he's incentivizing people to be obedient. And he's, again, like you can see, he's using religion. Yeah, and you know, I was taught as a, as a Muslim, like I was given examples of this where, uh, for example, when Muhammad commanded something, like when he said, grow your beard, it mm -hmm. became wajib or obligatory on people to grow exactly. their beard. You have to grow your beard. And mm -hmm. for example, you know, there was examples they used to give us where a man was walking and he was outside the mosque and the Jummah Khutbah was going on. And in the Jummah Khutbah, the, the Prophet said, sit down to somebody. And the guy sat down outside the mosque because he said, <laughs> he, I heard the Prophet say that. So they taught us this. They're like, no, you have to go whatever he says. Like, and you know, in some ways, this was kind of like Salafi leaning mosque, but like the Sufis, they take it to a whole other level. Like, they're like, <laughs> we're going to eat watermelon the way he ate watermelon. I, I don't even know how like he got three watermelon. Fingers, with the fingers like this, we're going to pick it up. <laughs> Those minor details I get into. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, I, I mean, who knows how, how strongly narrated those things are. But they want to do as much as possible. They, they even wear sandals that they think are like prophetic sandals, which is like, yeah. which is well, interesting. I, I, remember, I remember some narrations. That, I think it was Abdullah bin Umar where he was traveling and he stopped and he then pretended to trip over something. And then other companions like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, years ago when the prophet was alive, I saw him do the same thing. So I just got up and tripped myself <laughs> to imitate him. That's pretty funny. And I mean, Exactly, like the whole thing, like hold on to my sunnah. It's again incentivizing people that you got to obey me. It just comes back to that central point again. Yeah. And you know, to some people, this is actually, this actually helps them. They, they feel like, you know, the fact that this is all laid out for you, like what to do, that everything I do like Muhammad, I'm getting closer to God. They feel it's like a good thing. And so they go in the washroom, right, you know, left leg first, right leg. <laughs> so when you wake up in the morning, you're saying all these things. So your whole life is so so full of these things that you don't have time to really consider anything else. You just like, it becomes, but in some ways it's a challenge too, because you become so automatic, right? Like when you start doing all these things all the time, it becomes like, am I even feeling anything now? Am I just doing it because I have to do all these things? So that's kind of one of the downsides of having so many rituals that are, uh, you know, in Islam. Yeah, exactly. I, the, the one point uh, comes like the next verse, which is 2463. It's, it's just 
taking it to another level. Now here it says that you can't even address Muhammad the same way you address your fellow brothers or your friends uh, because Muhammad's special. And it literally says that if you dissent from Muhammad's order, literally dissent, do you disagree? Fitna like or a painful punishment will strike you. I mean, it, by this point, it should be obvious like how religious blackmail and belief is being used to incentivize people. Now, the same things repeated. Like, there's more and more and more verses. Like, I mean, this the verses I'm showing are just a figment of all the other verses that are there. Like, for example, four one fifteen says that anybody who poses the prophet after guidance has come to him, he's gonna go to hell. Just straight up says it. And 592, obey Allah and the messenger and beware. And then 4733, same thing. <clears throat> obey Allah and his messenger and don't invalidate your deeds. So if you don't obey him, all your good deeds go to waste. And there's a cute example will come up later, which is it, it, by the end of the, uh, the presentation, it'll be so, so, so obvious. It almost becomes like a joke. <laughs> okay, next slide. Yeah, so I'm on 8-1. This one, uh, like, again, is very important because war booty was very, very, it was a huge incentive. And literally almost most of the war, like the capital you would generate from war would be through war booty and slavery. And if you notice here, how people asked how to divide the war booty. No, Muhammad and Allah. Muhammad and Allah will decide, you know, like <laughs> just let it be everything. And I think there's a verse where it says that he and he used to of, he used to do a lot of things that used to piss off his companions. Like for example, yeah. there's one one case where he gave a whole valley of things to like one guy. I forgot yeah. what it was, and the rest of his companions are like, oh, we fought for it. We deserve more. Yeah, <laughs> and y'all like. And then he gave them a moving thing saying they get camels and you guys get the messenger of Allah and they were all crying and they're so happy because they get the messenger of Allah and, yeah. and these guys get camels and stuff. But but it's interesting. It was, it was uh, Muhajirin and the Ansar were like a, a conflict thing and yeah. so that's something like that. Yeah. The two tribes, yeah. Well, this guy was a new convert. I forget who it was. Or maybe he wasn't even a convert to Islam. So Muhammad, he gave him all of this money in order to convince him to become Muslim, right? That was kind of the idea. So that's why he gave a lot to this guy and then, you know, expecting that if he converted to Islam, then, you know, whatever would come. And, you know, in a sense, that was kind of like smut. Like if you have all of these people and you can like get them to fight for you and you don't even give them anything at the end of it. And then you have someone else and you want to convince him to join your side and you give him like all these gifts. I mean, maybe he was actually doing an intelligent thing for his cause at that point. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like, sometimes we don't give him credit. Like the guy, you know, succeeded. Well, smart. As, yeah. Like yeah. according to what assuming this is actually what happened we don't know yeah. for sure, but like the, the character is intelligent right yeah like like the the, the way he manip he knew exactly what to tell people and what they wanted to hear like he's very good with his words yeah. i'd give him uh, i mean we just what was oh war booty actually brings me to mind uh there's a whole thing where in the uh, where the muslims i think it's banu mustalik where they attack this tribe and then the men capture these the hadith literally is quite shocking in its wording in itself. It says that we, the Sahaba, we captured these fine, beautiful Arab women and we had been away from our wives. and We did not know what to do and if we could have sex with them. So the worst came down that you can, and the women were married. So they were more confused like, oh, can we really have sex with them? Because they're not single slaves, right? So the worst came down, yes, you can have sex with married slave women, even though their husbands might be alive. And then Muhammad also goes on, is like, oh, you can also use the, you know, the pull out method just so they don't get pregnant. And when you have to resell them, they have more value. And the way the timing of this revelation also fits in perfectly with the, the idea of convenient revelations. And before I forget, um, it doesn't stop here. The whole concept of Nasik and Mansuk, like the abrogation and cancellation of verses, is an extension of this uh, convenient revelation, or actually is the thing that enables Muhammad to uh, to make these verses up as he goes along. It it gives him the authority, like he gives himself the authority using Allah. And it's not limited to just him using uh, 
verses to his advantage, he would also uh, just uh, use it to cover up his mistakes. For example, like a verse where this guy was sitting behind Muhammad who's blind and Allah sends this verse, I think it's 495, Surah Nisa verse 95, about like people are not allowed to stay behind in war except oh, yeah. this, this, this and then the guy's like oh but what about me i'm blind and instantly he's like oh wait amendment to the worst and uh-huh. it fixes the worst and i mean same thing where there's a, there's a worst setting in surah bakara which talks about the tying the where you can see the thread of uh Fajr, the right? night. Yeah. yeah about fasting times and People were confused, so they actually started tying threads and waiting till they could see the thread if it was enough light out. So then, quickly, and because of the confusion, an amendment would come in to fix and resolve the issue. I mean, you'll see these uh, these things almost everywhere. And I mean, when you look in the hadith literature, it's it's shocking. The amount is amazing. Like what I'm showing you here is just like maybe 10%, not even of that. Let's get back to the slides. We were at verse 961. So here, like, I mean, this verse says you're not allowed to abuse the messenger of Allah. Otherwise, you will burn in hell. I mean, it's it's petty at this point where, <laughs> like, God is burning people in hell for somebody abusing someone. Like, does it really matter? Yeah. Like, God, you're omnipotent. You can protect your messenger. Like, why would you just burn some? It's like a child, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it follows on from... Um, well, if you can, you can relate this to Surah Lahab as well, where like, hey, you're up there, you know, Muhammad's uncle said, call them names. And then Allah just joins in in the yelling match, like oh. uh, like another human. Hey, yeah. man, he called you bad names. I'm going to reveal a surah calling him even worse names. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and again, a question is, is this really from the creator? Or is this like Muhammad's personality coming out, you know, like his projected uh, personality, Allah being that? Because we would expect better from God, right? We would expect uh, much better. Definitely, definitely. If you see these, you'll see the frustration in some of the verses where it it's like, especially when you get to the part where um, his wives come into play, I'll be part of three. But let's switch to the self-admiration. Now, the one thing you need to understand is- Sorry, which, uh, which verse have you on? Uh, we're on slide 12, uh, second uh, subheading. Oh, self admiration Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we start this chapter, I want you to understand that whilst reading the verses, replace the word Allah with Muhammad and try to read the verse again. You will realize how dark of a mindset one needs to have and how psychologically rejected one needs to have that he starts praising himself. Like the guy was, the narcissism really shows and you can see the desperation where he's praising himself to get the affection of his followers. And then he's giving them incentives as uh, in slide 13, like the first verse. Muhammad says that indeed in the messenger of Allah is the best example for you to follow till the end of times. He basically declared himself as the best man to ever walk the earth. And then in uh, Surah 68, verse 4, he's the best of character. Like, there's nobody who can match his, his character. While when we actually see his character, like, he's not the best of character mm-hmm. by any measure, especially in our the way we look at things now. Mm-hmm. Uh in 3346, uh, again, he's like the luminous lamp of God. Mm. And I mean, in other verses in Surah Nur, he even goes like, I am the light of God. And goes so, on like, God has sent you a light. <laughs> it's interesting that I used to kind of wonder about this too, when Muhammad said, I am the best of you, and I am the best of you to my wives, to the to his wives. Um, the best of you is he was best to his wives, and I am the best to my wives. And I used to wonder about that. I'm like, okay, this guy... He has so many wives connected to the mosque, living in little chambers. Like they barely have any room. They don't have much money. They're complaining in the Quran. They're complaining how unhappy they are. And Allah threatens to get rid of all of them. I mean, we're not talking about that here. But like, this used to make me wonder, how is he the best? And I'm thinking... When he's the one with the most problems, right? (laughs) Yeah, and like why, like, you know, like you would, you know, like in, in some senses, like I think actually Christianity that has monogamy it almost seems like, practically speaking, for most people, that would be better than polygamy, and in, and especially extreme polygamy, where you have like thirteen wives. I mean, I can't see how 
anyone, any of those women would be happy, right? You know what I mean? It's just such a bad situation for them, especially Aisha being like a little child, right? Assuming even if she was like 19 or whatever. Or was it Sauda that had to give up her day because she was too fat? Her night. Yeah. Her night. Exactly, right? Yeah. Like, how can you be the best husband yeah. when you're actually differentiating between your wives like that? And I mean, he also admitted, like, he straight up said that uh, I, my favorite wife is Aisha. Yeah. He spent the last days with her and would favor her and whatnot. Except she has said that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? It's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna get more interesting the when we get to his wives. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we're at worst 3356. Okay. This one is very important because literally this says that God, the omnipotent, omniscient creator of the whole universe of everything, is up there in the heavens along with the angels singing praises for his creation, a man named Muhammad. You're you're just you're just pushing it. Like at this point, you're just pushing it. Like <laughs> you're making God send blessings upon yourself yeah just so the other people will see this as something holy and they'll do the same thing which is what the words <laughs> literally says god is doing it and so are the angels you better do it too yeah it's and funny. Been, but what's, what's interesting is the very very next verse is the frustration is when i said when he couldn't get his way <laughs> one verse he'll ask something and the next he'll instantly start threatening people yeah. Surely those who annoy Allah and his messenger are cursed and they have a humiliating punishment. Like something must have ticked him off for him to use strong <laughs> words like this. Like somebody pissed him off. I, I have to say, <laughs> the funny thing is, when I left Islam, I had a friend who knows Arabic and teaches Quran in the mosque and stuff. And he told me the Quran has the same tone throughout the Quran. Mm -hmm. But it... It doesn't doesn't look like that at all. Like it's like he's obviously getting mad, and then it's coming out in the like in what's happening, right? So again, that's another red flag. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, if we go to the next one, mm -hmm. is where it starts getting more interesting. It's like we're talking about uh, himself admiring himself, oh. right? <laughs> it's like thirty, like where is thirty three six? Like he's closer to me than my own self and my family. Like, how is that even possible? Like, right? And then we can't. And then we can't marry his wives after he dies. Mm -hmm. Like, they're the mothers of the believers. And then he so also is a. Wasn't this? I don't know if this is true. I haven't. Like, uh, I remember there was that like, Zubair. Was it Zubair or one of the companions wanted to marry Aisha? And he <laughs> mentioned it. He mentioned it. After she, and after the Muhammad died, and then the verse came down and said, no. <laughs> His wife is like your <laughs> He shouldn't have mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you would see this, like, like Omar used to say, oh, I can see your wife going to the yeah. fields to defecate. You better have, have, have her covered up. And yeah. next thing you know, uh, worse about hijabs here. <laughs> yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, if we, if we, if, now, obviously, Sunni Muslims, to them, this should be like a huge red flag. But for us skeptics, like, it's possible that these were made up after the fact in order to praise Omar, which is what Shias say. They say, you know, all of these things that are claiming to be, you know, Omar's blessings. Now, mm -hmm. maybe they just made it up to make him look good. I don't know. But in either case, it's still a problem. Right? <laughs> either it's fabricated to, make, to praise Omar or Muhammad was actually making things up as he went along. In either case, it's pretty bad. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right? Like, you can't, it's the only way to think rationally about this. And you think about it, like, what is more objectively likely to be true? That this guy was actually talking to God, or he's just using God as a as a mouthpiece to get what he wants. And I mean, like, now he's appointing himself as all the mercy to all the worlds. But, like, there's verses in the Quran where he's inflicting terror into the hearts of the disbelievers how can you do both things at the same time like how can you be the mercy to all the world and then by self-admissions i was made victorious for terror and so 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 many uh, hadith it's i also so now let's get to verse number 3340 slide 16. Uh -huh. uh, before we go forward, the one thing I've noticed is one of the craziest surahs in the Quran, one of the weirdest chapters, in my opinion, is chapter thirty-three. Oh yeah. It's like it's it's like a psychological wild ride in his in his head. 
you start off by you know the battle of the trenches and then he curses the hypocrites and disbelievers so, so azab goes, azab yeah 33 which is in medina supposedly yeah. and after this fighting part is and then muhammad starts oh i'm the best man follow me then he goes on to his wife hey you better cover up i don't like you hanging out with other men then this is the same chat that c contains verses of him allowing himself to marry his adopted son's wife then him allowing himself to marry as many women as possible and then he keeps going on in this chapter where this is the same chapter where he says that god is singing his praises in the heaven and like okay. like this chapter when you sit down and th think about it like you highlight this you're like wow like, you know if, and uh you probably have more experience with this than me because i was in this like salafi community but i've been to masjids where they say muhammad was made like all of listen what listen to this all of existence was made for Muhammad to exist. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, at the other mosque I went to, they were like, this is shirk, you can't say this, this is haram, don't say this. But the other masjid was like, Muhammad is the, the, the light, you know, like basically, you know what, you heard these things. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> I think it's, uh, there's this thing in Pakistan, okay, whenever you hear Brailvis do it, whenever you hear Muhammad's name, you gotta do this, you gotta look at your thumbs, Kiss them and then touch them to your eyes. Oh, so whenever wow. you, what? yeah, no, whenever you, yeah, whenever you, these people will hear the azan and Muhammad's name comes up, uh -huh. or they're sitting in a khutbah, the whole the whole crowd will be like, <laughs> even when they're standing for the ikama. Wow, you know, I've never yeah, seen this before. Still do this. And then in, in one other thing I've noticed in in Pakistan was uh, as soon as the salah would uh, would finish, like the obligatory prayer with the jama, they all start singing the kalima la ila, and they go three times. And then they have this hadith in Bukhari saying that they used to hear noises of loud zikr coming from the masjid <laughs> of the prophet. But yeah, it's very interesting. Like I've the weirdest one was. I was traveling in Pakistan and I had to stop uh, to pray. And I go into this mosque and like, you're normally told to be no, leave no spaces between the rows and be as close as you can to each other, mm -hmm. lest your hearts will be stripped apart, right? Mm -hmm. So I was more like Deobandi Salafi at the time. So I go there, I'm like trying to fill the space and I'm at the end. Mm -hmm. And then this man, instead of coming closer to me, keeps going away <laughs> from me. So I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. And I was trying to like, fill in the space and he then, just would keep going away. After the prayer was finished, he told me why he was leaving the space because there is this verse uh, in the Quran, and again in Surah 33, I think it was Shahidan wa Mubashiran wa Nazira. And then this verse is interpreted by many Barelvi Sunni Muslims to imply that Muhammad is always oh, present. Oh, wow. Only present, yeah. Now, this guy told me that he was actually leaving the space so Muhammad could join and fill that what? space to pray with us. Yeah, I've seen bizarre stuff. Wow. Yeah. Oh, someone was asking, uh, Beach was saying, um, do you think Muhammad was a narcissist? Like, I mean, it's a personality disorder and obviously we can't know for sure, but like, what do you think? I would say, I would say he was a narcissist, but it wasn't that he actually... Like his narcissism wasn't the initial thing. I think it was a part of the the epilepsy he suffered from, where it was becoming inevitable with his, uh, the more his epilepsy progressed. Because when in his initial part of his life, like when he's a young kid, in his teenagers, and even in his early adulthood, you don't see these narcissistic traits manifest the oh, way they okay. did after he became older. I would say though, like in the end yeah he ended up being a narcissist was he consciously doing all of these things like that's another question in itself where i mean uh if there's another argument to be made with the epilepsy argument is that muhammad wasn't consciously doing all this manipulation rather than he would get so frustrated or he'll get so overwhelmed he will have these episodes and that is when the projection of allah would come out mm -hmm. Again, like the epilepsy argument, like it's very detailed, very long. It's way too much evidence to go through. We don't want to talk too much about this. Okay. So, so let's continue. This is a this yeah. is a really interesting topic. Yeah. So, like, uh, if we were at verse thirty three forty, okay, uh -huh. yep. And that's the one where he declares himself that he's not the father of. And here, the thing is, like, he's the last messenger. He says, "This is what's important." It's like, no, mostly people wouldn't. Heaven in the past him that oh there's nobody ever ever coming again after me. But he made a point and made it clear that 
I'm the last, I'm the most special, and there's none after me. Uh, so that's very important too, where he's putting himself as the epitome of mm. prophethood, prophets, right? He's the, the chief prophet, you know? And then following from that, like he led all the prophets in prayer when he went to his, his Mirage journey and all. So then the next verse, like 94, so, 4, it's so before saying, we get, before we get yeah. to that, um, okay, actually do this one and then I'll ask you. Uh, it's like uh, the Quran is saying that we raised the zikr, the name of Muhammad, we elevated it, and you know. So again, that's another self, like, self admiration. So you were saying something. Yeah. Let's so um, I don't know if you address this. So if not, let's talk about it now before we get go any further. Which is what about the times where Allah actually criticized Muhammad? So for example, you know Abasa, and uh, you know read the Quran slowly. Uh, is another example given. There's probably more examples I can't think of. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, oh, for example, um, why did you not have a great slaughter in the land? Why did you let? The, why did you ransom those people for money? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you wanted the money, but Jesus. Allah wants you to to you know whatever the, whatever the reasons are for for that. But but yeah, what do you think about those examples? Where exactly. <clears throat> because Muslims actually bring this up a lot. Like, why is it that if he's listen, if he's truly a prophet? He could never criticize himself even once. Even if he just said, don't talk to the blind man and talk to those guys instead. I mean, a real, a real prophet, he would never criticize himself even for small things like that. Like, come on. Like, that's, but that's the argument. So what would you say to that? Yeah, like I said earlier, is like once you get into the, the, the idea of like temporal epilepsy and then the personality disorders this, this guy had and the delusional uh, mindset he was in, that's where I was saying, like, was he consciously doing it or were these all projections of his frustration suddenly coming out where he suddenly wanted something so bad that he'll have an episode and then beads of sweat will come down and then he'll fall on the ground and say some verses and he'll marry his adopted son's wife. Was mm -hmm. that going on? Or like uh, the other issue is like he could, he could also be very, very smart and he was giving people what they wanted. When he thought that people are getting too suspicious, like his wife, <laughs> yeah. he would be like, just a little bit of self-criticism in there, you know? Yeah, because... It could just be that. I mean, honestly, this the self-criticism is so mild. <laughs> exactly, compared to the, as you can see, the self-clothing, like, he's just all over himself. <laughs> yeah, and um, the thing to... I, I personally think that the Zainab incident gives away the whole thing. By that point, I think he was making it up. I yeah. think there's enough evidence, like, that shows that maybe he just had some crazy thing happened to him in the when he was meditating and you know even even like sane people have uh episodes like psychotic yeah. breaks like uh, yeah. you know Aaron Ra he actually mentioned that when he was doing meditation he saw things like he actually saw things and and now that he doesn't do it he doesn't see things so it's like mm -hmm. people can see things but 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 I think that the Zainab incident gives away that at that point he was milking it like yeah. he was getting what I, he wanted, you know. <laughs> I noticed this pattern too. Like, I mean, is initially when you see in his prophethood, take example of when he started getting the revelations, right? People would taunt him when revelations would stop for a while. Like there were uh, the hadith literature, so there's years of gaps or times yeah, or and months, the sira. months. Exactly. So why would, and then that would bother Muhammad so, so, so much. And then, you know, he would he would come up with verses like his frustration like surah kawsar and whatnot initially i think he actually believed his delusions but over time he had a self-realization that he could also use this to his advantage and yeah. by that time when he had the self-realization it was already islam was already growing and he was like he's opportunistic and he used it be after that point like i said this is all contingent upon the fact that we accept the validity of uh, of the, the the serial literature or the hadith literature which came hundreds of years after the quran so like that's my take on the issue yeah. but i would definitely say that self-criticism when you think about it it's a very genius thing yeah you get most most of the benefits you can get and then you put a like 10 20 percent self-criticism to deflect the attention of people coming to this way you know yeah so Pretty that's fine. one way I'd see it. Okay, so uh, 944 is done? Or are we... Yeah, we okay. just finished so talking. So next one? Yeah. So here's an interesting bit. 
it's not just about him here uh, in uh, 833. It's a constant thing. Like when nations before Muhammad were punished by God, God would ask the prophets to build something or leave or get out of there. But he wouldn't stop or not send the punishment just because the prophet was amongst them. And whenever Muhammad was asked for a sign in the Quran, a miracle, he would always deflect it. Oh, it's like, oh, I can't give you a sign. But then his seerah is littered with miracles, like the, the hadith letters. The Quran negates every demand for miracle. And in this verse, what, uh, what, what the thing is being said is like, if Muhammad was in, he, the people asked Muhammad, oh, why can't God send us a sign or destroy us if you're so truthful? If we've been rejecting you for so long, we've been treating you so, what's, why is God not doing anything? Right? So Muhammad said, oh, because I'm, Allah doesn't punish you while the prophet is in there. But then one can ask, like, wait a second, God can invent, <laughs> laser guided missiles or something and just kill the specific people and the yeah. funny thing is like if or, or this, like the nation of lot or the nation of new where they went on the big boats and don't <laughs> yeah yeah like exactly and i mean in the seer literature itself there's this point where muhammad is uh is standing and he's going around the kaaba and these four chiefs uh started abusing him so then the angel gabriel comes and he points at one person and his head uh, blows up with pus later a few years later stuff like this and one guy falls off his donkey the next day and dies getting his skull crushed so i mean if god is punishing these trivial people like why can't he like do this or give them a sign mm -hmm. that's interesting that's that's i never thought of it like that like this is uh this is a weird thing to say like oh while i'm here you guys are fine. <laughs> if I go, you guys are in big You're trouble. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> and then, uh, oh yeah, the next verse, 4810. This one was very weird when I came across it. Like, it's, it's very explicit in terms of what it says. It literally says that pledging something to Muhammad is the same as pledging something with Allah. And then the Quran emphasizes it with the metaphorical use of the hand of God being over your hand when you're giving allegiance to the Prophet. That is just, that's like putting Muhammad like right next to God, you know? Like nobody can actually take bayah or allegiance from Allah because nobody can talk to him except through Muhammad. It's like this beautiful cycle of manipulation that he created. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, this one is funny. It's uh, next one. I'm uh, not, yes, uh, sixty-nine okay, forty. Yep. Um, like that's he's appointing himself and saying that this is definitely a word of a noble messenger. But when you take it literally, the verse itself, the Quran is the word of a man. It says, like this, somebody brought it up to me, but I'm like, obviously, didn't mean in that context. But it's kind of funny. Maybe there was a that was that a slip up. <laughs> Now you can. You can say that, but <laughs> that's not the word of Allah, then, right? It's the word of Gabriel. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's so many of these little pesky little details. I mean, hiding in the Quran. Um, there's this one that I always love. Is uh, there's a verse in Surah 69, Surah Al Haqqa, where it says that if Muhammad is a liar, we will cut up his aorta and we'll like immediately punish him. He mentions this punishment as. The worthy punishment for a false prophet or if muhammad was making something up but here's the thing he dies of the identical same thing a few years later after being poisoned literally all the words in the hadith say that muhammad died and self his self-admission was i feel like my aura is being cut mm, and the verse yeah. says La qata'na min watin, something like that that will cut up his aura the, the point is not is not that he was actually like uh, putting himself like 
you know, on the chopping board by saying that, oh, I'm false prophet, that's why I'm dying because of my aorta being cut. I think it's this speech pattern, this, this recurring speech pattern. Like Muhammad has said that thing years before that if I'm a false prophet, I'll die with my aorta being cut. But then the exact thing happens to him and he admits to it years later. It's a very interesting thing with like syntax and you know maybe it's just him repeating himself or foreshadowing could be a bit of both yeah so uh i so i didn't realize i was muted to the to the broadcast i was just saying this is a very interesting verse and wow you have a quite a way of finding these uh these interesting examples <laughs> I, I never thought of it even if it says this is the word of gabriel which is what i was told it doesn't make a lot of sense why would god say the Quran is the words of Gabriel, Angel Gabriel. Like what? Is it supposed to be the literal speech of yeah, God? Yeah, it's a bizarre way to to put it. Uh, okay, so okay, so next one. So this is the most interesting part. This so now is Muhammad using the Quran. Yes, this <clears throat> is the part where all the fun is. So, <clears throat> uh, like I said, I didn't put all the detail in here. Uh, if anybody wants to read the detail about this, let's get to slide 20, and it's uh, Surah Ahzab, verse 37. It's one of my favorite surahs in terms of the amount of BS it has in it. <laughs> uh, this verse is, as you can see, where Muhammad abolished the idea of adoption just so he could marry his adopted son's wife. The interesting bit here is the details of the story as mentioned in the Sira and the Hadith literature. And it slips through in the Quran here too, which is, it's very irresponsible of Muhammad even say that. Like he's just putting himself, he's exposing himself. The story was that Muhammad's uh, adopted son Zaid bin Harasa had his beautiful wife Zainab. Now Zainab bin Jaish was very beautiful. One day Muhammad went to visit Zaid. He couldn't uh, find him, but he went to the door and Zainab was there and she got up and then she came to Muhammad and she was wearing revealing clothes. So something happened in Muhammad's heart. He uttered something over his breath and then walked away. And apparently the dealer just says that Zainab always had her hearts out for Muhammad because she didn't actually want to marry a slave because Zaid was actually a freed slave. Anyways, so the funny thing here is what Muhammad really had feelings for her. As you can see, as the verse itself implies, <laughs> it's like, but you had hidden in your heart what God was to disclose, what was hidden in Muhammad's heart, right? So Muhammad literally used God, and this is the funny part. This marriage happened in the heavens. Mm -hmm. it, like, God married Muhammad to his adopted son's wife and abolished adoption for that very specific reason. It's at this point, it should be crystal clear that this man is manipulating. Now, some people might say that, okay, how did Muhammad knew Zainab from before? Why didn't he approach her then? Um, the issue here is firstly, he might not have seen her the way he saw her that day. And secondly, the way his delusion was progressing, we find a ditto copy example of what happened here in real life in the 21st century. There's a cult leader called Wayne mm, Bent. Yeah. His, what he did, it wasn't his adopted son. He married his actual son's wife. Now the way he, he played out and he explains it on his interview was like he was sitting and then God came to him and he fell on the ground and he had this episode and God told him what needed to be done and from there on he went on. And the, the striking similarity is just shocking. Like it's the same, almost the same thing. If if anybody ever wants, they should definitely like, it's like a minute long clip, I think. Yeah, so I just put on the screen. Uh, I know you can't see it, apologies, but um, if you want to watch the video, would you marry your adopted son's ex-wife? I, I got this clip from Abdullah Gondal and I put it right in there. And uh, this video is banned in Pakistan. So if you're not in Pakistan, you are lucky you can see this video. Pakistan has gone out of the way to ban this one specific video. It has 8,000 views. <laughs> That's 8,000 views and they banned I, it. I love the, I love the Urdu <laughs> version where Harris said the, 
<laughs> the voiceover was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that one's even that one was banned first, and now I think even the English one is banned. So uh, yeah, so um, just a few comments in the chat saying that <clears throat> this is interesting in the context of thirty three thirty six as well, saying that it's not for anyone to have a choice in the matter, and uh, Zaid is the only one mentioned in the Quran. Um, what I was taught was that what he hid in his heart was that he had to marry Zainab, you know, his beautiful uh, cousin slash daughter-in-law. That was what he was hiding. And the reason he was hiding it was because everyone would think he's crazy. And he's, um, exactly. you know, right the, the P-word. Not, not the P-word, not the pedophile P-word, the other P-word. Um, because oh, it, is, it, it is actually <clears throat> a very strange thing to like, you know, once someone is your daughter-in-law, it's kind of, she's like your daughter, your little daughter, even if it's not actually your son or not, but like you see her in that sense. So to, to see her in the other sense is like really strange and it's taboo, yeah. right? And it, it's taboo for a reason because there's some, there's some bo- boundaries there that can, if they're crossed, it can be like power a lot of, a, yeah, yeah, power and abuse and, you know, it can lead to a lot of kind of terrible things. So there's, yeah. those taboos are there, um, even in his the culture. Worst- the worst literally is is so ridiculous. It says, nas. Like, you were hiding because of the people. Like, You're you were scared, scared of what they're going to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. And you're more scared of Allah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And well, what's interesting is, is the Prophet cons. So there may not be any restriction for the believers in respect of the wives of their adopted sons. Did this become a trend like everybody's is marrying their adopted son's wife? Why mention that? It's a very, <laughs> it's such weird a, this, this whole incident is so strange. Um, obviously, adoption was forbidden. So you can't even adopt per se anymore. Yeah. So it's, why would Allah want to make this clear to believers? It's such a bizarre thing. I, I actually have a video on Zainab, a long video where I go through some of these things in detail. Um, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next continuation of okay. this uh, Zainab thing. Well, after he married, Zainab, he was having his feast and after the feast, he noticed like a few of his companions are hanging around, chit-chatting away and then Muhammad is too shy to ask them to leave. So guess what happens? The creator of the cosmos steps in to tell his guests, please don't don't linger too long. Wait, hold on. Are you on 66.4? I am on 33.53. Oh, sorry, sorry. I missed this. I think I missed the slide. 30, uh, 33, oh, it's on 33.53. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So then, like, God tells, like, God avoided so many important things to mention in his last and final communication with mankind, but he made sure to tell us that you should not linger in Muhammad's house because he gets annoyed. And I mean, when you actually go into the details, studying the revolutionary, the, the circumstances, there's a point where these two Sahaba are chit-chatting, and then one of them says, oh, I see the prophet isn't happy, wait for it. It's coming. <laughs> and literally that happens. Like it's one of the hadiths I posted about it in detail. All right, let's go to the next one. 66.4. This one is very, very interesting. Like the, the precursor to this incident is uh, it is about Muhammad being caught sleeping with his slave called Maria Kibtia. And he was in Hafsa's bed, I believe. And it was Hafsa's day, and Hafsa got mad, and she told it to Aisha, and then they started uh, conspiring this against them. Um, basically, they were unhappy, and they didn't want Maria being around, so they wanted to get rid of her. Muhammad wanted to keep Maria, and I mean, when you read from the first few verses, you notice that Muhammad's like, Allah is telling Muhammad, your wives might not like you having sex with your slave girl, but doesn't matter. Allah allows it. Go for it. And then literally the next verse, he says, you are absolved of all your oaths. What? And then, yeah. yeah. And then the conti- you're not obliged to uh, to hold you on to your oaths. And then it goes on, continues on, where then Muhammad uses Allah, literally straight up religious blackmail, saying that if your wives don't straighten themselves <clears throat> out and be obedient and nice wives, well... Let them know that Allah and the angels and all the believers are against them and mm-hmm. that Allah can just replace them with new ones. They could be virgins. They could be just better in every way. You know, this is interesting. I, I just want to kind of jump in there for a second that 
Like people have said to me when I said, well, Aisha was trapped in this situation. They say, oh, she could have just left him. Like, really? Really? What happens? Come on. Who in, <laughs> like, like, look, look, look at this. Like, all of the believers, like the Quran is threatening the wives, saying all of the believers and the angels and God and this. And, and they believed in this, okay? Like, they, some of them grew up in this society. Like, for example, Hafsa, she's a daughter of Abu Bakr. Uh, sorry, Hafsa, daughter of Omar. Omar. Uh, Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr, they grew up in Islam. They believed, I think many of them believed in it, right? I mean, this is what they were told to be, was true. And, and they believed in it. And did they really have a choice? I don't think so. It's, it's a mental prison where and you can't, you're, you're just saying like, hey, you don't like me? You can leave. But when you leave, I'm coming for you. And there's no freedom what kind of, of religion. Is that? There's no freedom exactly. of religion back then, right? There's no like... Like, what are they going to do? I mean, they, there was a possibility they could have ran away and, and went to, like, the Roman Empire or something. I don't know. But, but then they'll become... They don't uh, even <laughs> and they don't, even, they don't even speak the language. Or, like, I mean, imagine, like, how difficult that would be for them, right? So, um, yeah. Well, the thing is, like, it doesn't stop there with his wife. Like, this surah itself, like, if anybody has a chance, read it from verse 1 to verse 12. So, very interesting. So one more thing I want to say about this is I was taught this is related to honey. And exactly. Stink, stinky now, here's, honey. Here's the funny bit. Here's the funny bit. Uh, wait, wait. Have you ever heard of stinky honey? I've heard the whole story. No, no. Is, have you ever smelt honey that gives you bad? Like, is there such a thing as stinky honey? It might be. I don't know. I, I <laughs> I've had honey directly from like those uh, hives with yeah. the honeycomb and everything. It smells and tastes yeah. fine. What yeah. I could see is it's like, not like if, onions and garlic. Come on, it's honey. If, like, why would it give you bad breath? Keeping in mind, like, it's high in glucose. And back in the day, but the, the, the dental hygiene wasn't a huge thing. <laughs> yeah. And if they eat too much honey, but they don't eat a lot of other food, it might give rise to bad odors. Mm. But I mean, oh, well, Muhammad so, was gullible in this sense and he just believed his yeah. wife. Well, this I, was, it, Interesting is the there's one Sahih Hadith, and all almost the earlier Sirah literature says that this incident relates to the Muhammad being caught having sex with a slave girl. There's a Sahih Hadith in the site, and then you're also telling me that this verse is revealed for a petty, petty thing where Muhammad's mm -hmm. eating honey. Why would God be threatening his wives like this for over honey? It doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. So you can admit that okay, the hadith either contradict, or the honey thing is a cover up, or the Quran is just so poorly written that it doesn't make any sense because it's expressing undue and unproportional anger over something as trivial as eating honey. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good. That's a good counter. Now let's go to the next slide. Okay. Back to chapter thirty-three. One of my favorite chapters. <laughs> okay, so the next two slides, like from thirty-three twenty-eight to thirty, you will see Muhammad's jealousy in full swing. Like he really did not want other people messing around with his wives. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is this incident was like Muhammad was having issues and they complained about not having enough money so muhammad instead of giving them money and stuff there's an other incident before i get into the details is in the hadith muhammad has his wives around him complaining that they don't get enough and aisha and hafsa uh, don't get enough they, money you mean right yeah they don't they're not being getting enough worldly things yeah and omar comes in and abu Bakr comes in and they start laughing that these wives are saying that and then they slap their daughters like Oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Over this thing. And then Muhammad retreats, I think, for like 28 days or 29 days into his 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 hut on the roof away from his wives because of this incident. And now, instead of Muhammad talking, he's using Allah to talk for him and negotiate for him. Or not negotiate, is basically threaten and blackmail his wives into obedience again. Like, if you really think that you're not getting enough and you want the worldly life, we will give it to you and we will let you go. Like, okay, well, if you could give it to them, why didn't you give it to them yet? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a good point. But but if you want Allah and his messenger and the invisible imaginary afterlife, to them it's realer than this life, then you, you got to stay and be patient with whatever Muhammad gives you. you know? mm -hmm. The next verse is like, <laughs> 
he's so jealous. He's like, if anybody else's wife's commit adultery, it's okay. But if my wife's, <laughs> you're gonna get double the punishment. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what, are you gonna stone them twice? <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. I didn't think about that, too. Or, and then it's the continuation of the verses in the next slide, mm-hmm. uh, 33, 31 onwards. Yep. And who, whichever one of his wives are pious, they'll get double the reward, you know? <laughs> like, he's, he's making sure, like, <laughs> from every angle that they have really no choice. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, just think about it. He's already threatening them in such mischievous and manipulating ways. You can already see the extent, the psychological extent and control this man has. If they actually took a stand against him, He's not scared of threatening them here. He was straight up thrown under the bus. Yeah. He scares himself. Yeah, but these are these are like you mean like psychological threats, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like a psychological prison. And then here again, like in thirty three, thirty two, you're not like other women. You're special women. You know, you can't talk to men. Like he doesn't even want his wife speaking <laughs> to men in an in a polite way. <laughs> like, come on. And Amazing. then here, here's the best thing. Uh, verse 33, 33. When somebody asks you why the hijab is in place, this is why. Don't make your beauty and don't display your beauty like you used to in the days of ignorance. He's talking to his wives. The wives are the best example for all mm. Muslim women. Mm. And you can now see the actual motive of hijab is just to cover women's beauty. Like, self-admission right there and i think later on in one of the verses he actually goes beyond just covering as like a facial he says put a barrier between the men you talk to the same same chapter you can also see like the progression of his jealousy and (laughs) frustration (laughs) yeah yeah and hey you know it seems like he didn't even believe aisha when she came back from the incident of ifk when she was left behind and this young, beautiful, handsome man, who I forgot who it was now, uh, he brought it back to the town, everyone, everyone's tongue started wagging, saying they, they did something. It, it seems like Muhammad didn't believe her. And she was crying to death, according to the story. She, was, she made herself so sick. And, uh, but Muhammad didn't, didn't have anything positive to say to her. And he was Different. asking everyone, like, what do you think about Aisha? Well, Ali, what do you think about Aisha? Uh, Zainab, what do you think about Aisha? According to the hadith, right? He was questioning everybody. Why would he question other people if God is telling him what happened? Hmm. Zach, what's hmm. the whole point? If God's going to tell you she's innocent. <laughs> so when hmm. he exhausts finally, all the possibilities, yeah. okay, I think she's innocent. Okay, now it's time to put the worst <laughs> in there. <laughs> well, not even I think she's innocent. I have to do some damage control before it gets worse. And yeah, she's innocent. Okay, like she's going to have to be innocent. Uh, Allah is going to have to make her innocent. Now, the weird thing is, I don't totally get how this works, but Shias don't think she's innocent. I don't quite understand how that, how they just throw out the words in the Quran. But anyways, that's a different topic. Let's not, let's stick yeah. to the topic. Yeah. So before we progress further, just one more thing was, uh, this, the, the exact verses aren't in the Quran anymore, but it's the, the verses, uh, the satanic verses incident. That is also a prime example of uh, using the Quran to your own benefit. And the story, like, it's very, very well preserved in uh, in the Sira and the Hadith literature. And there's, according to Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, who wrote the, the the exegesis of Sahih al Bukhari, he says that there's two Mursal Hadith that also confirm uh, Sahih Mursal Hadith that confirm the incident as recorded. Uh, about the satanic horses. What happened was Muhammad and his people were suffering a lot of execution and torture from the Meccans because they were opposing their gods and advocating a completely opposite way of life. Uh, to the point it got so desperate where Muhammad was reciting Surah Najm around the Kaaba and he got to the end part and then he mentioned the gods of uh, of the Kuffar at that time, the idols, as high-flying cranes, okay? And then this, the the rest of the incident is still preserved in Sahih Bukhari and other Sahasatta books, where it says that everybody, including the Kuffar, fell in prostration. Okay. Now, with the original ending that we have now, 
it's actually going against their gods. So it doesn't make sense for them to fall prostrate there. So he did say something that they agreed with and they fell prostrate too. Now, uh, what followed on was like uh, people were, uh, the first migration to Abyssinia had happened. They thought, they heard a rumor that, oh, Meccans have accepted Islam. So they migrated back almost and found out halfway that no. Uh, but this is very well preserved. Even in the, if you open Jalalain or Tafsirs, it's in there too. And the verse itself, the wording is also preserved. And then Muhammad realized when his followers started questioning, wait a minute, you were telling us to worship one God and he's no idols, blah, blah, blah. And now you're telling us that, oh, these idols are also some demigods you can you can use or supplicate to. So when he realized it, like he added the amendment in it. And the whole story goes that Gabriel came to Muhammad and this is hilarious. If you can open up, I don't have it here, uh -huh. but open up Surah Hajj, verse 52. I believe that's the one. Surah Hajj is 22? Yeah. At 2252? Yes. Okay. Okay, got it. Yep. And okay. we did not send before you any messenger of prophet except when he spoke or decided Satan flew into some <laughs> misunderstanding. <laughs> it's about the satanic verses. Now, the problem was the cover-up. The cover-up had to have happened. This is the cover-up happening. Mm -hmm. The verses that were in the satanic, the verses themselves are preserved in the hadith literature, but the cover-up is still found in the Quran. Literally, God is saying that every messenger that has ever come, sometimes they recite something, but it's actually Satan speaking from mm -hmm. their tongue. But then later, Allah will come and fix it up for them. What? This <laughs> throws a... It's very There's strange. No integrity. <laughs> like, very how strange. do you trust if everything isn't from Satan? And how do you distinguish which is and which isn't, right? Very strange, yeah. Like, the mere fact that this verse exists is just problematic enough. Like, this. this <laughs> but, anyways, we sidestepped a little bit. <laughs> Let's get back to, I think we're on slide 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. So, in these two verses, you literally see that Muhammad gives himself an exception from the rule or the limit of marrying a maximum of four wives, where he says that if anyone offers herself to you, you can you can marry her. This and the verse, it literally says, Prophet wishes to marry her. This is only for you, excluding the other believers. It's like the most <laughs> exceptional exception he's created for himself. <laughs> and then it says that, we have made known obligatory concerning their wives and their rights. So basically, they know that they can't go beyond the limit, but Muhammad can. And then the next verse goes on. So you this is a this is a very confusing. This is basically uh, a situation where somebody came up to Muhammad and said, "Oh, hold on, wait, wait, that's different. That's that's fifty one. Fifty one is saying that. No, actually, this is a different situation." What what is yeah, this what is this describing? Uh, basically, it's. Uh, oh yeah, so a believing woman who gives herself to the prophet. Okay, so somebody comes up to the prophet and says, "You know, marry me," and he, it, it's saying she does. He doesn't have to give her mahal, I think, right? No, it just says that he can exceed the four women limit. Oh, like even, okay, yeah. okay. And uh, I think it's Tabari. He mentions in history of Tabari, oh, one of the okay. volumes. Mm -hmm where a woman comes, she's from a noble family, gives himself in marriage to Muhammad. Muhammad accepts. She's happy. She goes back to her family. Her family's like, what have you done? Muhammad is a womanizer. What are you doing? You're apart from a noble family. So then she went back to Muhammad and got the nikah nullified. Voice, right? Yeah. And 3351 is describing, oh, I, isn't this describing like the situation where, uh, for example, you don't have to sleep at Sauda? Like you can just basically... Yeah, exactly. You can make special basically, exceptions or something, right? Yeah, you can you can make special you can do whatever you want. You basically just yeah. giving him a license. <laughs> the Quran should just be one verse. Just just Muhammad, just do what you want. Allah. Signed Allah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a blank check. You can just write whatever. Yeah, it's a blank Quran's a blank check, isn't it? <laughs> and it's the next this after these two verses, even Aisha was like, yo man, you can't be that stupid to not notice it. 
Like, if you go to the next slide, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's commenting on the verses, and she even said, It seems that your Lord hastens to satisfy your desires. Hmm, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, that's... God that's, is always running after Muhammad's that's pleasure. That's strange, yeah. So, let's keep going. Let's get to... Oh, the Qibla. This is classic. So, uh, the very important thing happened was when Muhammad initially migrated to Medina, he had a potential group that he could have converted, which was namely the Jews that had been living there for years. Now, the Jews would pray, f or their Qibla was Masjid al-Aqsa or Jerusalem. So initially, you'll see, even in the seal literature in the Quran, like Muhammad starts by, even in the Quran, you see this progression of frustration, where initially, the Jews and the Christians, they're good people, as long as they do the righteous deeds and follow their books, they're going to go to heaven. But then slowly and slowly, when Muhammad tries and tries ways to please them, and they just refuse to bend or accept him, and they're just straight up calling him out, if we just don't believe you, then you can see the gradual shift in tone in the Quran, where from good people who will go to heaven, Jews and Christians, you can't be friends with them, they're enemies of God, they're always conspiring against Muslims, and it's like a conspiracy theory level of uh, paranoia he almost exhibits, where uh, they are like dogs and donkeys, and then all sorts of uh, insults start going in. So once he realized that he cannot convince them by showing them solidarity, by worshipping in the same direction, he then wanted to solidify his own position and his own religion. And we all know that Muhammad was born in Mecca. He was he had a longing for that place. It was his hometown. And you, this, these verses straight up tell you, we have certainly seen you going, asking God to change the Qiblet so that so basically we accepted your dua and you can turn your face because <laughs> it's your hometown. And then the next verse goes on, like who you can do whatever, they won't believe you. And anybody who disagrees with you is among the wrongdoers. Like, do you see the frustration come out? Like, the one after the other. So the, these kind of mind games like he was playing, I mean, once you look back at it, it becomes very obvious. And the problem is, is you can so clearly see that Muhammad had not thought out everything. He was taking things, like, if it goes, it goes. He'll go upon the situation. And that's why it's the idea of having a continuous revelation is smart in that sense where you can just, it's malleable. Instead, if you write a whole book, well, you're just stuck with a piece of literature, right? <laughs> All right, so, so now just we to, get... So just to uh, yeah. add a little tiny bit to this, Qibla is a direction of prayer. And what Abdullah Gondal was saying was that Muhammad, uh, and I, I think this makes a lot of sense, he was he was originally facing the Beitul Maqdis, the Masjid al-Aqsa, the Jerusalem, the same way that the Jews were praying in Arabia. And he was praying the same direction, so to kind of have something in common. And eventually he changed the wall thing and everybody got mad at him, and so he's basically justifying it. So yeah. It, just one verse is Dr. Zakir Naik's favorite verse. I don't know why it popped up in my head. <laughs> it says, Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa im baynana wa baynakum. It's, it's, I think it's Surah Imran, verse 64 or something. It says that, come to the common grounds between us. Like it's telling the Jews and the Christians, be friends, be together, do the same things. But then you've, like I said, like when he realized that, oh, it's like a losing battle, they're not going to convert, you just see the sudden shift in tone and frustration. Yeah. In fact, one hadith is very important where Muhammad, before he expelled any of their tribes, oh, let me ask you to try to find it. Before he expelled any of their tribe, he went to these tribes and gave them a warning accept me as a messenger of god or i will expel you once i come into power and you will see it's it's in the sahih uh, i think sahih bukhari in muslim i'll have to find it okay but it's uh, it goes on like it fits in perfectly with this uh, this whole <laughs> idea of like him so just summarize it so what, what was it what happened um so initially like when muhammad uh migrated to the to Medina, he saw the Jews and the Christians as opportunities to grow his religion by converting them. That's why you see him be initially trying to be very friendly with them, showing solidarity with them. You're praying to the same direction. If as long as they're initially, you don't even have to be Muslim. 
the verses in the Quran. Oh, yeah, initially. yeah, yeah. You can yeah, just be a good, good Christian and Jew, yeah. and you'll go to heaven. Yeah. But then later on, you when he realized that, oh, these people aren't converting, there's a hadith where he goes and threatens them that he's going to expel them when he comes into you know, power. You, you know, this is very interesting. I never thought about that. The politics what if, surrounding it. What yeah. if, what if, what if it's true what you just said that like in the beginning, Muhammad didn't even care if they converted. He just wanted the political power, mm -hmm. and so that's why the verses of the Quran. Because I've heard you know some Muslims are confused by it, and they're like, why does the Quran say that you know there'll be no fear upon them, nor will they grieve, meaning they won't go to hell? You know the Jews will believe from the Christians and Jews, and and you know my 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 teachers used to say no 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 those who believe means those who believe in Muhammad. But then but they're not Christians and Jews. Yeah. So that they're so, saying so they said it means the ones that converted to Islam. But that's like such a weird way to put it. Though, like those who believed from Christians and Jews, that's Muslims, actually. But but anyways, wh whatever the case is, maybe this is an I don't know, maybe this is crazy or maybe this is an interesting point that early Christians and Jews were not expected even to convert. They just they were just supposed to be like Muhammad was just appealing to them, hoping that they would accept him as a prophet, exactly. even though we were a Christian, so which didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so, yeah. it, the, the politics surrounding the whole thing is very, very interesting when you think about like how his life progressed, his decisions. When you you have a bigger picture and you look back at it and you apply like, like political science ideas, you're like, whoa, this guy... Like, I mean, obviously there's some things he could have done better, but like it's it's very interesting seeing his the dynamics he created, especially with the Jews. He did not like them. <laughs> so let's get to uh, slide number 28. Mm -hmm. 49 to... Yep. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is interesting. See how Muhammad is literally using his position as a prophet to demand respect saying that if anybody speaks loudly to Muhammad, he will lose all his good deeds. And then he reinforces the idea by saying that indeed the be the best believers are the ones that speak to Muhammad in the most polite and the most uh, calmest tones. Do you think, at this point it's just like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Like He's literally making God demand respect for him so that people don't like say, speak <laughs> like God. <laughs> It's a song of self-explanatory. Yeah. Now, before we get into the next uh, next uh, phase of this, graphic content, <laughs> his followers did very oh. interesting things. <laughs> uh, like I said, I haven't. I've only included a few things. Like uh, I will mention certain narrations that some scholars say are true, some aren't. But let's get into what we have now. Okay. So we are on slide number thirty. So, as you can see from that little connotation at the bottom, the Holy Spittle is finally here. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, just to give you an idea of the level of fanaticism these guys had from Muhammad, or what had, he had created in their minds, was like, these two people were promised some glad tidings from Muhammad when they asked. <laughs> they, they rejected the glad tidings, seeing what it was, and then he's like, okay, well, I'll just give him two people who like him. So he gave him to two of his... So <laughs> the message, I'll read it out for you guys. Yeah. The messenger, mm -hmm. the Allah's messenger called for a cup of water and washed his hands in that and face too and put the saliva in it and then said, drink out of it and pour it over your faces and over your chest and gladden yourselves. They took hold of the cup and did as Allah's messenger had commanded them to do so. But here's the funny bit. His wife was hearing this behind the curtain, and she's like, "Spare me some blessed holy spittle water too." <laughs> and they gave her some too. I mean, I'm just showing this one version of this hadith. There's like, it's recorded in Bukhari, Muslim, and one other place, about the same. But the yeah, the, they're just rubbing used ablution water and a spit on his body, and it's not like they're just doing it out of himself. He's actually commanding them to do it. Wow! Like, look. <laughs> and then he he wow. said, "Drink out of it and pour wow. over your chest." <laughs> like that is Crazy. that is just beyond. Like you're convincing people that your bodily excrements are somehow blessed. <laughs> wow, interesting. Let's get to the next the mm -hmm. next one. I mean, this is one example. He spit. He's he loved to spit, man. Like I don't know what the hell was with him. <laughs> This time, like, the food is, they're running out of food, so, oh, make the prophet spit in the food and you'll have abundance of food. <laughs> 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 like, 
the holy spittle man really <laughs> it was it's working magic for those guys this is amongst many of the things is uh uh you know what they call <laughs> in french pour homme <laughs> <laughs> the perfume, oh, cologne, okay. oh, oh, the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just diluted sweat, you know. <laughs> there were companions of Muhammad who would literally take his sweat and apply it on their bodies as cologne. That's just, this is bizarre to a next level. Like, I mean, come on. <laughs> like, the guys strange. actually got you convinced that his sweat is. And if you go into the details in other narrations, it's this musk smell from paradise, something like that. Like, yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next one. I guess there's another one here. <laughs> the okay. Tent? Yep, the last slide. Okay. So I'll, I'll just read this one out for you guys. I came to the prophet while he was inside a red leather tent. And I saw Bilal taking the remaining water of ablution of the Prophet. So he's already used the water. He's taken the, the leftover. And the people were taking that water and rubbing it on their faces. And whoever could not get any of it would share the moisture of their hands <laughs> of their companions and then rub on his face. Oh, wow. <laughs> These guys were so fuck obsessed. Yeah. They're they're running after each other just to touch the water Muhammad touched so they can rub it on. So, yeah. And uh, this reminds me of the saying of, uh, I forget who it was, but it was during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when they sent a messenger to talk to Muhammad and try to convince him. And he came back and he told Abu Sufyan, these people, they respect this man. I, I, I wish they would have said worship this man, but I think the Muslim narrators scratched out worshipped and put respect. They respect this man more than the kings of uh, whatever, Rome and whatever he mentioned, right? It, like, this, this is worship. Like, if this is not worship, I don't know what is. <laughs> right? Yeah. I forgot to put that one hadith in there where it says, uh, no one will have... Oh, wait, I found it. Perfect. Uh, no one will have true faith. Uh-huh. Till he loves me, that is Muhammad, more than his father, his chindril, and guess what? All of mankind put together. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, actually, I want you to show it on. Like, okay. This, uh, I'll send you the link. Let me... Okay, there's Sky. Yeah, so there's this thing in Islam that you have to love Muhammad, which is a very strange thing because you can't like choose who you love right it's either you love someone or you don't but like muhammad commanded people that you have Force to love, love. <laughs> yeah it's so bizarre like it's such a strange thing that uh with hold on uh where's the link oh here's the link okay oops shoot the link didn't copy one second okay okay there we go None of you will have faith till he loves me more than his father's children, all mankind. <laughs> hey, come on, dude. Like, I mean, at, <laughs> and we haven't even brought up the idea of blasphemy yet. Like, these people would, like, just kill anyone, everyone, whoever abused them. <laughs> oh, geez, that would have been interesting. I mean, it would be way longer. I mean, I just to give you an idea of, like, two incidents that come to mind. Mm -hmm is uh, the incident of the blind Jewish slave. I don't know if you can, you can find the hadith mm -hmm. too, if you sure. can on Sunday.com, yeah. straight okay. blind Jews. Is uh, this lady was a slave of this uh, man in Medina. Oh, I found it. And, and she used to slander Muhammad, or at least not mention him in, yeah. in good words. Yeah, she used to abuse him. The, yeah. Owner, yeah, the owner of the, the lady was a Muslim. He was blind, actually, I think. Yeah, he was lying, and then one night he warned her to stop abusing Muhammad, and yeah. she didn't listen. So he, she, this lady had a kid, and she was pregnant, I believe. And yeah. He so just what stabbed. happened was, yeah, she began she began to slander the prophet. So he took an axe, placed it on her belly, pressed it, and killed her. And then the messenger of Allah was told about it, and he said, "Oh, people, be witnesses that no dia, no blood money, is to be paid for her blood." Narrated by Abu Dawood, and a trustworthy chain of narrators. It's also found in the site. So there's mm -hmm. two different books that say it's uh, Sahih. But I mean, and th this shows like these people 
persuade the fanatics. There's this one point where Muhammad ordered the killing of one of uh, the, the leaders of the Jews. I think it was a uh, Obey. No, it was uh, Kab bin Ashraf. So when he was killed, the other wanted to kill somebody else because the Muhajireen had killed. I don't know. It was one group of people that killed him and the other ones also wanted the reward. So they found this other poet and Muhammad sent another assassin team to go kill that one. I think it was Abu Afaq. Um, like when you look at it, like this guy, he's demanding absolute blind obedience and servitude. He is going to extents where he's not only self-flattering, He's showing extreme signs of narcissism, delusion. He's projecting his jealousy on it through God in, into scripture. He is solving his marital problems by using God as his mouthpiece and basically using religious blackmail. He's using God to get unlimited women for himself. And he's... He's getting the one fifth of the booty. It's just once you look at it from any objective lens, you come to the striking realization that the guy was, if not willingly, was constantly or at least definitely manipulating people. Like he was, like I, I think it, this leaves no shadow of doubt. This isn't from God. I mean, it's just there's too much, too many red flags here, yeah. <laughs> as you say. Um. And it just brings me back to the point, like how did how do Muslims not see these inconsistencies? Like the funny thing is what I like doing is I I, I make these scenarios, but I change the words or the is names of places. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'll change the name slightly and then I'll ask Muslims to comment on it. They'll be like, oh my God, this is so terrible, blah, blah, blah. But then I'll think, oh, by the way, it's actually your prophet. And you see a sudden like their faces drop. No way. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like they're, I've actually seen Muslims defend the Holy Spittle. <laughs> yeah. They've actually, there was this one guy who told me that his saliva had medicinal benefits. <laughs> it's interesting. Because he, he wants, here's the funny bit. He spat in Ali's eye because his eye oh, was Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And then his eye became, and I'm like, okay, first you're using your own text to prove it itself like that's just circular like it's not gonna get you anywhere yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's i just sometimes i just want to bang my head on the wall sometimes like, why don't people see this it's so 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 self self apparent yeah yeah exactly it gets, it gets frustrating uh, after a while too i mean <laughs> yeah you can't i guess it's one of those things you can't you can take a horse to water but you can't force it to drink um yeah so yeah we we all we have all we can do is just to keep sharing these things you did an incredible job in uh putting this together um it was like a it was very eye-opening <laughs> uh we should do another one and uh on a different topic of your choice um, on, I, I love how how directed you are with these references. It's like, you know, like you brought up examples that I've never thought of in reference to like this topic. Like I've heard these things, but I've never connected it to this this theme, you know. And this idea of having like one central theme where we discuss and we just like build on it. I mean, that's amazing. I, I love that. I know, right? And I mean, there's so much we skipped, man. Like, there's we could have gone into, like, for example, the constant mentioning of Muhammad's name during Salah, oh. and then the Tashawud being obligatory. With if you don't send salutations upon Muhammad, your Salah isn't accepted, like yeah. straight up. <laughs> right? Things like this. Yeah, and like, there's a there's a hadith that if you don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, after his name. Your du'a exactly. is held up. It doesn't go to Allah or something. Yeah, you have to say more durood. The more you sal send salutations and love to Muhammad, the more it's probable that your prayer will get answered by God. Yeah, so strange. Like, yeah. The, the, like it's it creates such a mental prison, man. Once you get somebody to believe that God is talking to me, from there on, it's a downhill slope. He can do whatever <laughs> he wants to you. Like yeah. today, actually. <laughs> totally, totally. I was, uh, I was, I was coming back uh, from work and I came across these two individuals and I, my bus was all like 20 minutes. So I'm like, okay. And they were giving a free Bible. So I started talking to them, you know, like what, what concept do they have? Like how, what lens do they look through at religion? Right. So 
uh, he had this Arab Bible and a bunch of different ones. And I asked him, OK, how did we come about? And he's like, oh, Adam and Eve had sex and we are here. So I'm like, well, and that my first reaction was, well, that doesn't really make sense from an evolutionary or a genetic perspective. As soon as I said that, his wife replied like, oh, uh, you came from two people. How can't we come from two people? And like, it's just sad seeing like people not being able to think outside the box. Like, and these, a lot of these people, it's not that they're they're stupid or they can't think. No, a lot of these people are doctors and engineers and very qualified, even have high IQs. And they're very intelligent. But then when it comes to religion, it shuts down. The critical yeah. thinking shuts down. And it's, it's the way the knowledge is compartmentalized. And that's yeah. what the difference is between indoctrination and choosing your own religion because the way indoctrinated beliefs affects you they they get so ingrained in your brain from such an early age it is so 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 hard to to go through to let them go i hope uh if there's if there's muslims watching this like they actually put a thought towards this that what is more likely to be true? We have a book that appears stuck in time in the seventh century. We have a man that propagates seventh century ideas and his ideas are outdated. They are not good for progress in, in the future. Maybe just think outside the box. Maybe see these inconsistencies. Maybe he was making it up. Is it more likely that an angel was talking to him that too alone and nobody else could see it? Or is it more likely that the seventh century man was opportunistic and saw suffered from something and things kind of got out of hand and people living in in that era of uh, the scientific uh, era of scientific ignorance and superstition just didn't have the tools to decipher what was going on or there and people were historically gullible yeah still are <laughs> and and you know we can also like remind people that there's very little we actually know, like actually know about Muhammad. Yeah. Like we actually, actually know. There's so much question, so many question marks. And uh, to to the the viewer that said Abdullah Samir will be a Christian one day, he's just on a <laughs> transition, so it'll not be obvious he wanted to convert to Christianity. Um, no, no, not really. It's not such a move is predictable, but it's not predictable. It's not happening. I don't know. Maybe it'll happen, but it's it's very, very, very unlikely. The same reasons I disbelieve in Islam are the same reasons I disbelieve in Christianity. There is just no good reason to believe any of these books are from God. There's no good reason to believe that the entire world is is um, wrapped around an incident that happened approximately 2,000 years ago that supposedly 500 people saw and supposedly was written down in some book and supposedly now 2,000 years later we hear about it, that it happened and there's, there's, there's almost no two, two accounts of it that actually add up. I agree. Yeah. Whether, he was in the, whether he was in the tomb, or whether he wasn't found in the tomb, whether he <laughs> appeared and said, I'll meet you over there in Galilee, <laughs> whether he was already in Galilee or not. Like, there's, no, there's, no, there's no consistency in these stories and we're expected to believe that this is God's incarnate son that came down from the heavens and we, all we have is some scraps of like like parchment that 100 plus years after like people are writing about what happened and we're supposed to believe this like it's, come on <laughs> I'm not I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah it's just, it's sad to see like billions still like we're in the 21st century I mean and we're still stuck with this problem. Like the problem is like religion surviving to this point isn't proof that religion makes sense. No, religion yeah. has been fighting a losing one way battle for centuries now. Yeah. It is a manifestation of human nature, of tribalism, of, of, of our stupidity and gullibility. In fact, like yeah. we just have a tendency to believe things that not necessarily make sense, but they make us feel good. Yeah. You know, and that's very important. <laughs> Absolutely. 
You want but, to take some questions and then wrap it up? Yeah, I'll uh, take uh, five minutes of questions and uh, we will just end it on that. Uh, so in case you're saying that because I did poorly on my last debate, uh, that's that's true. I did do poorly with my U Ross debate. Uh, the guy is a very intelligent man and he came he came at the Bible from a very different angle than I was not expecting, which is the Bible and science. Well, <laughs> to be honest, the Bible and science do not mix like th- those two topics no. they don't go well together I but you remember what Zakir Naik did to Dr. William Campbell <laughs> yeah and and but 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 you Ross has been writing books on this for like his whole life and I I don't I can't cross like I couldn't challenge him on his quotes because I don't know the Bible and I didn't know those quotes so a couple of times I asked him something and he said something and I had to look it up after the debate so I, maybe if I have time I'll kind of do a summary of where I went wrong. I know Abdullah Gondal has already posted some some really good points that I actually did actually miss. Uh, but it's it's kind of difficult sometimes when you're on the spot. And you know, honestly, I was feeling a bit intimidated by him. Uh, the the man is like in his seventies, and he's he's been doing this his whole life. He's way out of my league. So um, you know, a mutual friend asked us to talk, and and I did. But I think I, in retrospect, I definitely wasn't ready for that so it's fine it was a learning it's a learning experience but i am no way i am in no way convinced of christianity just because the arguments he brought i i feel like he's very much stretching the meanings of words right like Sof- sophistry that's like like you gave an example right Abdul Ganda, like how using a word that meant something back then and giving it a brand new meaning that that doesn't exist anymore uh, sorry that never existed and you're kind of projecting that back on what did you call it you see it's, it's the equivocation fallacy. I and think he said something. Jesus, ab- you said something? I said Jesus, yeah. Isagesis. It's basically reading your own bias into the text. And that's what essentially it was. I mean, I wouldn't say you did terrible in the debate. I wouldn't even call it a debate because there was yeah, no moderator. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't a debate. And there it was, was no struggle. Yeah. It's, it's a discussion. Yeah. And I mean, you could see that he is very articulate and eloquent. But a lot of the points he made did show uh, uh, he, he made a... Uh, a lot of fallacious claims and it did show the constant recurring problem like his arguments suffered the same problems the quran and science arguments suffered. yeah like like just one example which i missed in the beginnings was the heavens and the earth like it's the first verse of the bible it's already wrong like yeah. right at the beginning there was no earth in the beginning in the exactly. beginning was the heavens and then and nine billion years later i made the earth not in yeah. the beginning was the heavens and the earth no so, so, I mean... Or, like, the flowering plants. Well, I mean, we can go yeah, on and on. Yeah, yeah like exactly. The thing is, yeah. he was a guest, and you have to be nice because it's your first time, right? Like, yeah. and if you want, you can do it again, and maybe next time you can be more confrontational. <laughs> yeah, I think that was my mistake, too, not being confrontational enough. But, yeah, that's a different topic. So, uh, yeah. so let's wrap it up, then. Um, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much, Abdul Gondo. Oh, I love You're back on Facebook for now. Uh, until, <laughs> until you get, you get banned, banned again, again, unfortunately, there's no yeah. real way to to survive these social media purges. I think the only real thing that survives is my blog that hasn't been shut down yet. And even like Atheist Republic, they were like dosed, right? So their, their mm-hmm. website went down, but that only goes on for a while and then eventually goes back up. So yeah. um, that's not like a permanent ban. That's more like you just flooded and you can't. Your site is inaccessible inaccessible um okay so so thanks again everyone for joining and thanks to the couple of people that donated as well appreciate it and uh we'll we'll have abdullah gondal on here again before you know it thanks abdullah take care bye